So by the late 1960s and into the 70s, the United States was experiencing a massive amount of trouble uh, in terms of its ability to remain both active in the Cold War and still an, an international economic powerhouse. So what was causing this problem, right? The United States was experiencing a sort of the end of that post-war, post-World War II success that had dominated, let's say, the 19, late 40s, 50s, and then into the 60s, early 60s, that is. So after World War II, the United States was really the only democratic power, power that was able to um, really support the rest of the world, right? So the United States is doing the Marshall Plan in the 1950s. It has the Korean Endeavor from 50 to 53. And the United States is, and, you know, is, is supporting Japan uh, through its uh, different you know, uh, occupations, right? However, by the late 1960s, and really certainly by the 1970s, the economy of the United States is beginning to falter. That great economic output that the United States had had for the last 20, 25 years could not be sustained anymore. There's also the spending that was going on for the Vietnam War that really uh, caused a lot of inflation. So if you look at this chart, right, one of the things that happens by 1970, certainly, is that CPI, so that's the consumer price index. Uh, the consumer price index is basically if you take a big basket of things that all people buy, milk, butter, cheese, eggs, gallon of gasoline, all these different products, right? It's a way to show what the inflation is uh, or deflation is. Um, and if you look here, right? So CPI, consumer price index, is at 6% uh, inflation every year. Just for you to know, right, a healthy inflation is between two and three percent. So we're double what uh, in 1970, we're double what that should be. Now you'll notice it dips. Uh, so from 1970 to 73, it goes down. But then if you look from 73 to 75, it goes up 12 percent. So again, roughly six, four to six times what it would be in a healthy economy dips again, but still we're not, you know, we're not going down to what it should be. Uh, we're going, you know, to what, 5% still, 2% above what it should be. So the 1970s is, is a period of massive, massive uncertainty. And in, especially if you look at the unemployment rate, 4% is a very healthy unemployment rate. Uh, sort of full employment is considered 3%, but then it rises to 6 and then it never really goes back down. It's at five, up to nine, and it stays around six uh, for the remainder of the decade. So the 70s are a period of really, really, uh, real, real uncertainty. Now, why is there this uncertainty? The first major reason is that there's oil crises or oil crises. There are two of them. So in the 1970s, uh, or in the 1960s, excuse me, there is an organization that is formed called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. And by the 1960s, this organization is a very powerful agency because this is a way for them to control prices. It's a way for them to control production. It's a way for the oil countries, uh, the countries that produce oil, to, to sort of work as a negotiating block and not undercut one another. So there are a series of oil crises in the 1970s, particularly because, if you remember back from the last two weeks, we've been talking about the rise of consumerism. So people have more access to cash, more cars are being produced and bought. So there's more demand for petroleum, oil, gas. Uh, in the 1960s and 70s. So the, so the petroleum industry, the, the oil industry, is becoming a lot more powerful in this respect. So 1973, 
if you look back here, right, when does the spike happen? 1973, there's a, there's a reason here. In 1973, a small war breaks out between Israel and Egypt. Uh, I should say Israel, the Jewish country in uh, the Middle East, and then Egypt and Syria over, um, over the Sinai Peninsula, over the, over the land between the two. Uh, between Egypt and Israel, Syria backs them. Syria backs up Egypt. So this is a, a conflict between a Jewish country and then two Arab countries. When that happens, the United States supports Israel because the United States has always supported Israel and still does to this day militarily. So the United States goes in to aid Israel. And as retaliation for that, Syria and Egypt and other Arab oil countries refuse to sell oil to the United States. What happens as a result is the United States goes, uh, the United States oil production or um, oil access goes down significantly. So oil prices go up 400%. Uh, so let's just put that into perspective, right? I mean, this is 1970s, so gas was, was roughly 35 cents a gallon. So instead of 35 cents a gallon, you're now paying what, $1.40 a, a gallon. So it's significantly less compared to what we pay today. But that obviously has, you know, that, that's a huge increase. But it's also important to remember, again, if we go back to this chart, right, goes up, uh, you know, CPI goes up, what, uh, from 4 to 12, so by 8%. When gasoline goes up, it's not just that gasoline is affected, it's that your the the cost of your food getting to the supermarket has to go up because the trucks run on gas. The amount of goods going into, you know, the, the, the cost of your heating for your house goes up. All of these things increase by a lot. Now why why is why does that happen in, in another piece, right? I have two pictures here on the bottom and one's gets cut off uh, because of uh, because of the, the anyway um, so you have the oil crisis one reason the economy is starting to fail the other reason that the economy is starting to fail is competition from abroad in a lot of ways the United States had become a victim of its own success in the post-world war ii era in order to prevent the communist countries from dominating one of the things the united states had done is that the united states had um re had invested a lot in places like west germany japan um other parts of europe britain france italy and as a result of that the, by the 1970s, right, so again, 25 years after the end of World War II, these countries had become extremely powerful in producers of goods. So Germany, right, the Volkswagen, uh, the Volkswagen Beetle and the Volkswagen cars in general start to be, start to flood the American market. Uh, and the United States is, is at first very happy with this. Uh, this is sort of a sign of their success. However, by the 19 by the 1960s, right, the, the, the Volkswagen Beetle becomes the sign of the hippies, right? You have the image of these hippies jumping out of the Volkswagen Westphalia buses. Anyway, by the 1970s, uh, this competition from abroad, particularly with Germany and Japan, become extremely um, Com competitive to American industries. So for Japan, right, you have the Toyotas and, and, and other, other cars flooding the market as well. Now, the reason that this is happening is they're more fuel efficient than American cars, right? I have an image here uh, of a 1970s Cadillac, nice and huge, right? Uh, you know, gigantic wings. You could fit like seven people in the back here. In comparison, I have a, a 1970s Toyota. Uh, much smaller, much more efficient, right? So you have you have fuel efficiency that is a huge thing, and then bam, oil uh, embargo happens. Nineteen seventy three, you've got this gigantic car that gets twelve miles a gallon, or you've got this tiny little Toyota or tiny little Volkswagen that gets you know twenty five thirty miles a gallon. People are going to start buying those up. So again. 
then one of the other problems here, competition from abroad, is that the United States is a victim of its own success. And, and this would also play into that, right? There are multinational corporations. By the 1970s, you can now put production all over the globe. You don't have to have production in the United States any longer. And it's much cheaper to have it's much cheaper to have your headquarters maybe here in the United States, but then have production in other parts of the world where, where, empl where employees can be paid less money. So this allows, again, for, for people to sort of shop for wages. The last piece in terms of the economics that I want to talk about here is what is sometimes called the Rust Belt, right? Um, in the United States, production is moving outward, competition abroad is, is, is c creating demand for foreign goods over American goods. And again, so what, what do you have happening here? You have the sort of unemployment of, of, of people throughout the United States. This is called the Rust Belt, right? So you have, you know, in the coal producing areas, right, places where, uh, you know, we don't have a demand for coal in the way that we used to. There's certainly a reduction. But then if you look at the industrial areas of the country, right, this red area is where sort of old factories would have been starting in upstate New York, going across upstate New York, down uh, down through Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, right? Uh, you have huge uh, southern Jersey, right? Uh, particularly like the Camden, Philadelphia area. So huge impacts. All right, now let's then talk about politically. Politically, the United okay. States is also shifting. The Cold War has been going on for uh, 20 years by this point, 25 years by this point. The United States just can't keep up with this sort of tension all the time. So there is a reduction in tension. Um, now, President Nixon, who is the president from 1968 onward, um, doesn't necessarily take the sort of hard line, uh, produce, hard line issue that, that had for so long, right? Instead, he's going to support, as, it's, as I say here, they're going to, to support free nations. What that means is the United States is no longer going to impact nations that are going to be coming communist so they're going to prop up those who are already capitalist or democracies it's again it's part of this fatigue with the cold war so let's then turn our attention to the watergate issue so the last big thing that really impacts the 1970s is in terms of this fatigue of the cold war is the Watergate scandal. So in the 1972 presidential election, there is a lot of concern from the Nixon party about the potential to lose um, the potential to lose the election uh, to competitors. So one of the things that happens is that a group of people from the Republican Party and Nixon's party wound up breaking into uh, the Democratic National Convention headquarters at the Watergate complex in 1972. And then there's a huge cover up by President Nixon, and, who was president from 1969 onward, uh, and his secretary and his vice president, Spiro Agnew. Now, there's a lot of things that go on, and I guess in the era of the impeachment trials that we recently had, you know, there's a lot of questions about Nixon, right? And the question about Nixon was, when did he know, what did he know, and when did he know it? There are tapes that Nixon had and, and all of these things. What ultimately happens is Nixon is forced to resign along with his vice president, Spiro Agnew, and Gerald Ford becomes president. Now, Nixon's fall from grace is one of the greatest falls of grace, right? Nixon was probably one of the most can, most uh, well, well qualified presidents uh, we've ever had. Uh, but this is sort of a huge fall from grace. Gerald Ford becomes president, and he is the first person that is has never uh, never ran for an office to become president. He's the he's only unelected. Uh, now, you know he comes in, but he has huge economic problems that are, that are sort of grip grip crippling his um, you know crippling his his administration. 